I got to ask you first, um, because I think it is um, indicative of like the value of this and the importance of, 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 of understanding stories like this. The future front lines. What, what exactly is that uh, initiative, if you will? Yeah, so, you know, Future Frontline is a program that kind of evolved out of some work um, my colleagues and I were doing uh, and looking at 21st century proxy warfare. So when you get somebody else to fight your wars for you, um, basically. So some of the things we're seeing in Syria and Iraq and so forth. Um, and as we started picking at this, we realized that a new feature uh, of conflict today of all kinds, armed conflict, you know, just kind of your standard fisticuffs involves um, propaganda, right? It involves information warfare online. And so we kind of conceived this program with the idea that the new front line um, is really political warfare online. And and we should say um, it also, um, I think you're also literally spotting those new uh, front lines on that platform, which is a new front line uh, <laughs> and that emerging um, because this is, you know, and, and I, I mentioned this uh, before we started to, to record this interview, um, uh, the nature of what I have done in doing uh, this program or one similar over the course of the past. Uh, well, really, I mean, I started on AM talk radio 15, 16 years ago um, has changed where my understanding of what is politics has had to expand with the development of things like social media and these virtual worlds that exist online. Uh, at one point, I remember uh, dismissing Gamergate, which was ostensibly about ethics in gaming, um, uh, game review uh, journalism, uh, but was also turned out to be basically just uh, a, a misogynist um, uh, sort of uh, altercation between two people uh, that grew into this supposed movement, which ultimately was exploited by Steve Bannon and Milo Yiannopoulos and created communities that ultimately led to, I think, enterprises like the Proud Boys and uh, other groups that ended up being you know, some form of shock troops, we saw some of them, uh, many of them arrested in, on January 6th um, or in, in, in the wake of January 6th. Uh, and so this this has a lot of resonance. And it um, and you have written extensively here on the the thread of Michael Flynn. So let's go back and just give us a sense of where 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 Michael Flynn sort of entered into this world and at what point does he, um, I guess, intersect with QAnon, uh, which I, I am not convinced that four or five years from now, QAnon, well, three years, two years from now, will be as big as you know what we referred to as the Tea Party. I'm also not, con not convinced it's not the same people, but be that as it may, wh when did uh, Flynn first come on the scene? Well, I mean, Flynn kind of enters the scene very early, right? I mean, with with his elevation to the national security advisor position in the White House under Donald Trump, um, you know, within days of the election back then, so new November uh, of 2016, uh, Flynn gives this speech that like has become kind of this uh, mantra or kind of rallying cry of what we now know today as the QAnon crowd, right? The QAnon movement. Um, and it was a speech at the Trump Hotel and that he was giving to the Young America Foundation, which is this conservative outfit, um, you know, that kind of targets young Americans who are who are into things, all things Republican. Um, and so he, he gives this speech and he explains how, um, you know, this this online movement that Trump and his allies have created is kind of like a digital army. And he says, you know, we had this movement, this insurgency of digital soldiers. Right. And that becomes digital soldiers becomes this kind of signature, um, you know, you know, catchphrase of this online, you know, social movement of conservative um, pro Trump Republicans who kind of swept into the White House. But it's actually, you know, very soon after that, basically, as a scandal erupts over Flynn's connection to to Russia, or at least his alleged connections to Russia, um, and then his conversation with the Russian ambassador, and then he gets fired, right, in February 2017. Um, and it's not very long after that, you, you start to see that actually the evolution of this idea that Flynn has been sort of victimized 
uh, in some way by the fake news, the fake media um, begins to kind of bubble up online on sort of these fringe platforms, uh, one of which very famously uh, 4chan, uh, which also intersects with the Gamergate um, phenomenon that you just mentioned. And it's there, you know, in October 2017 that we start to see the convergence of Flynn's influence and his idea about raising a digital army of digital soldiers converge with this conspiratorial um, QAnon movement that erupts on, you know, in October 2017 on 4chan. And how much expertise, I mean, this is the thing that's important to, to point out, I think, about Flynn, um, is that he served in the Obama administration, or, I, I you know, he was a military uh, during the Obama administration, and I think he had um, an intelligence, a uh, fairly high-placed intelligence role. So he, it seems to me, would maybe not necessarily have a savvy about technical things, but he would certainly have savvy about the power of online propaganda, right? I mean, this isn't a guy who's just coming out of nowhere with this idea of a digital army. This is clearly modeled on some paradigms that he had seen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, he actually, his brand, right, has always been I'm I'm the intelligence guy who thinks differently. I'm the intelligence guy who, you know, um, thinks about fusing different methods like signals intelligence, open source, you know, information to try and get at like what's at the heart of, you know, a social phenomenon, right? And in fact, in his his biography, his sort of semi-autobiography, which is kind of co-written um, by another kind of conspiratorial thinker, uh, you know, he talks about his early experience in the army, uh, working in signals intelligence, and then with some special programs. He didn't really go into detail, but he does talk a little bit in his biography about how he was involved with some special programs um, that seemed to have to do with the early days of the internet. Not clear exactly what that was. Um, and then that, of course, over time, it involves uh, evolves over time, right? His experience in Iraq. Um, where he gets exposure to, uh, you know, uh, high value targets and tries to kind of gather new information um, using, you know, stuff that's left in safe houses, right, where uh, Al Qaeda uh, operatives are, are hanging out. And then he kind of transits that over to uh, Afghanistan, where he's the commander for um, intelligence. Um, and actually, I was in Afghanistan at the time when he was there. Um, and I remember that time very well. Um, because I think a lot of journalists, actually, um, I think any journalist who was there in Afghanistan would tell you, uh, you know, Mike Flynn was kind of a revelation for uh, covering Afghanistan because he was opening, throwing open the door to criticism about how intelligence had been handled up until that point um, by U.S. Uh, military folks. Right. And so um, and then when he gets, you know, over to the Defense Intelligence Agency, you know, Obama appoints him to head basically this sprawling Pentagon intelligence service, um, it's kind of the same mantra, which is essentially we've got to, we've got to be, we've got to think out of the box, we've got to innovate, and we got to blend all these different kind of new methods of gathering intelligence and then leveraging intelligence to influence, uh, you know, events on the ground. And do we know, and uh, because, and this isn't directly a part of your story, but it is sort of fascinating to understand the sort of where this guy's coming from. Barack Obama sort of famously warned Donald Trump uh, following the election when they sat down to sort of, I guess, uh, metaphorically pass the baton. Um, he's, he warned Donald Trump about General Flynn. Um, there's various reports and reporting over the years that have said, like, you know, Flynn seemed to go a little bit um, uh, crazy and, you know, not a, I don't know what the clinical, uh, you know, assessment would have been, but there was there was a sense that this guy is not just an innovator anymore that he's like falling down some of these uh, rabbit holes. And it seems like it went beyond just like he's, um, you know, buying into sort of right wing memes. I mean, it, it, it sounded like there was like a real genuine sort of concern that was not partisan by Obama in, in, in talking about uh, Flynn. Hi, I'm Sam Cedar. You can watch the rest of this interview and more on our Peacock show, which streams at 5 p.m. weekdays on The Choice from Peacock TV.